We're gonna give it a try anyway. So if people are coming there, we can just come in, it's fine. And um, the technicalities here are a little bit uh, different. I don't have a click or anything, so I'll be around here. It's uh, also to check my notes, of course, but uh, I won't be moving around too much. I hope you can see the screens and the audio is fine and we're ready to go. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Broholm, and uh, I've been for the last two and a half years doing polyglot interviews, multilingual interviews on actualfluency.com, which is also the name of the podcast. And I'll be coming back to that later to talk about just what that is. And I'm 20 years, 28 years old. I'm from Denmark. And uh, right now I live, I guess I live here in Montreal now. I have all my stuff with me, but I'm planning to go back to Budapest on Tuesday where I've been living for a year up until now. Um, so this presentation um, is going to be a little different from some of the other presentations. And uh, I've been thinking about this topic for a long time as it's a very personal topic for me, but also because it's kind of, um, let's just call it a, a heavy. Uh, some of the stuff is a little heavy. And uh, as uh, some of you might remember from the famous uh, Back to the Future movie, uh, Wade's got nothing to do with it. Um, so I just wanted to put that disclaimer in there that this topic is a little heavy. And it, you know, this, it's not because it's uh, sad or anything, but it's not the uh, typical on a program like this. And I hope that you'll enjoy it for that reason. So we're putting some perspective into um, what is essentially real life. You know, sometimes when we're running around having fun and uh, talking about learning languages on the internet and you know, be 20 languages or whatever, I mean, this is real life. There's gonna be good, good things, there's gonna be bad things, and we're gonna deal with the problems the highs and the lows together. And um, so I want to provide this perspective that I don't see a lot of. And um, in terms of the presentation, I was thinking about how to do it. And I thought, you know, some presentations have a practical aspect to it. They want to teach you something. They want to show you how something is done. And some are more technical. It could be science-y, uh, instructive maybe, like language presentations. Um, and some just kind of tell a story. And this is what I've been going for here. So this is one of those presentations. Because I thought the best way to kind of talk about this topic, uh, share my own story, uh, would be the best way to, uh, to go about it. So um, going back to half my life, I guess, I'm 28 now, so when I was 14, Everything was fine. I was living the dream, I thought, at the time. I was in a small city in Denmark. I was at a private school. I was playing football. I was doing everything, having a great time, top student. Okay, maybe not top, but at least 80%, uh, you know? And um, <laughs> uh, that's good enough for me. And then um, suddenly, out of the blue, and you know, when I, it's funny when you look back, you, is, you always see the writing was on the wall for a long time, but my parents got divorced, as so many parents do today. Um, and it totally broke this illusion of, I think uh, here in North America, you sometimes refer to it as the American dream, you know, with the house and the two kids, the dog, the car, whatever. And it totally shattered my world. And this was uh, what uh, basically happened. And so this began a long time. You can see if it's 14 years ago, uh, this really uh, has taken a long time for me to, to come to this point. Uh, but this began a long, long uh, descent of basically what is depression. And we're going to get into that in a, in a minute. But just to sort of spice up the story a little bit, I guess, um, after my parents divorced, I lost my father, which happened two years later, which is obviously huge loss, uh, it was uh, epilepsy uh, during a seizure. So that kind of sucked. And my grades plummeted as a result. And the teacher was like, are you OK? Is there anything wrong? Can we help you with anything? And the truth is, when you're 15 or 14, you don't have any clue what's going on. You just say, yeah, everything is fine. I mean, it doesn't bother me. But the truth is, inside, of course, you're in great grief and turmoil. So you don't understand uh, what go what's going on. So just a few more things happened. My room burnt down, so now I'm uh, kind of uh, scared of fire. But um, that's, I guess that's a good thing, so you're always on guard. Um, so basically, in other words, um, a lot of shit happened. <laughs> and I think 
I think a lot of people in depression can kind of relate to this, or people who have suffered from depression or cycles of depressive mood, because who we are today is kind of a, a whole package of our life until now. So for me, this is kind of my backstory, and it's not one that I tell very often, and I, I certainly haven't told it in this detail before, but I feel like it's important to understand where I'm coming from with what you're about to hear now. Um, so after that, it was basically just like stuck. Stuck. Um, I turned to uh, video games, food, isolation, as many people do in that situation, you know. Uh, and food is something I still struggle with today. Uh, that's going to be something I'm tackling over the next few years to try and, and get that uh, under control. But the general word that I came up with is just hopelessness. You know, I don't know how many of you guys have tried to be in a depressive state at any point. But this is kind of the worst part. It's, it's not, you don't even see things as bad. You just don't see any future at all. You just think, well, I have nothing, you know? So it's not negative, it's just nothing, which is worse, actually. Um, and I was in massive denial, which is also common about depression and <laughs> overweight, <laughs> as it happens. Um, and I think that's a big point, because if you're in denial, you're not seeking to solve the problem. And... Um, it took me far longer to actually realize that and get a move on, basically, uh, than I could have. So it took me years and years, and by the time I was in my mid-20s, I was in doing dead-end jobs, uh, boring. I n couldn't imagine myself doing them forever. Uh, no career prospects. And I was doing education, and for some people, education here seems a little bit interesting. That, oh, that seems like you're on your way to something. But the thing is, in Denmark, they pay you to go to university, and it's free. So going to university is actually kind of a benefit uh, thing. Uh, you know, you just get paid to do nothing, basically. They check you once in a while, but the universities get funding based on how many students are in the university. So they don't have an interest in kicking anyone out, because then they get less funding. So a lot of Danish people, even though not everyone cares to admit it, will sign up for a random university degree just to get uh, the benefits. And it's not a great life, you know, it's not like you get millions of, of, of dollars every month, but it's fine for most cities to live on and go out once in a while and, you know, have a little room. So, so that's what I did, just as a kind of a, a placeholder situation. But then I finally admitted I had a problem, and I realized after, I guess, 10 years of playing video games and eating pizzas and burgers that this was, uh, you know, this was a little bit fucked up. So I went to the doctor and said, I feel like this. And she said, you're depressed. <laughs> OK. I mean, that's uh, it's one step closer to something, at least. you know, Because if you don't know what's wrong with you, then you don't know what to do to fix it anyway. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, analogies to language learning here as well, but I'll get into that in a, in a minute. And even though I figured out what was wrong, it didn't mean that it just overnight, oh, yeah, now I'm all better. You know, I tried medication. Uh, it didn't really work for me. It works for a lot of people. Um, but for me, it didn't really do a difference except massive side effects. And in that case, you just feel worse, actually. So um, I was looking for ways to naturally uh, improve my state, my, my mind. And the big question was still, what will I do with my life? It was this hopelessness I was trying to answer. And then one fateful night in my, again, mid-20s, this is about, I mean, this story takes place uh, from I was 14 to about three, five years ago. And I, just, I came across this site. Uh, some of you probably heard about it. Uh, <laughs> during three months. And I was like, Wow, this guy, uh, Benny, the Irish polyglot, I mean, he's really, what's going on there? I mean, that's a life, right? I mean, that, I could do this. This would be great. And um, so I, I spent the whole night reading his entire archives. And uh, <laughs> if any of you have done that, you know it's quite an extensive archive he has built up over the years. And the reaction was just like, wow. I was like, wow, this could, you could travel. And, you know, he's basically living the dream. You can... In a way, you could have it all. Uh, you could travel, you can learn new things, you can meet new people, you could see new things, you could live in foreign cultures. Um, and then suddenly, when I was doing this, I was suddenly thinking, wait a minute, I used to like languages. I used to love them in school. <laughs> I was like, English was 
fun. It was the best subject I had when it, we, in Denmark we started around grade two or four. Um, and I just remember it was so much fun. We had uh, songs like, who stole the cookies from the cookie jar? <laughs> who, me, no, and you, me. And it was just so much fun. I mean, this is like 25 years ago. <laughs> no, not 25, but it's uh, 20 years ago, and I still remember those stupid songs. But it just shows uh, the kind of enjoyment I got out of language learning. And by the time I got into German, I was still really enjoying it. And then I moved cities, and then all this started. So I just really, my German is really fragmented. Whereas my English is, I think is quite good, you know, because of that difference. It's a huge difference. Now I can speak German, I can understand most of it, but I'll make mistakes every, every sentence, even though I had it for 10, 10 years in school. Um, and I used to be good at learning them too. I, I mean, people were asking me, how did you learn English? Your English is great. And I said, I don't know. It just kind of happened, you know? Um, and just, one day I was walking home from, from school, I think I was about 11 or 12, and I just thought that English was such a beautiful language, and I still believe this today. And I just thought Danish was such a clumsy and hard to pronounce language, and I, I switched in my mind. And to this day, I still use English as my inner, inner voice. Um, so right there and then, I made a choice. And making choices is, is a new tactic for me, um, because I found out if you commit to something, you usually get it done. If you say, I'll probably do this, I might do this, chances are you'll probably not get it done. So for instance, uh, last year we had the Polygon Conference in New York, and for a European, going to North America is quite a, it's quite a utopia, actually. For me, I've grown up watching all these American films and TV shows, and it was kind of like a fairy tale to even be in North America. But I just said, when I saw they posted it was New York, I said, I'm going to make it. And then you can start saving you know, a year in advance, and then it all makes sense. And in the same vein, I decided when I was reading Benny's blog, and I was thinking about what to do with my life, I just made the choice to pursue languages. What does that even mean? You know? And I just thought, maybe a little bit naively, that with languages I could do anything. And I don't know if there's a truth to that or not, um, but certainly at the time, the, it made a lot of sense. Uh, today, I think it's a little bit arbitrary, but um, I think languages is one of those uh, branches of study that you can kind of go anywhere. You know, you can be a translator, you can be an interpreter, you can, you can be hired as an advisor, you can be part of the foreign branch of a company in XYZ country, you can, uh, there's obviously the teaching route as well. And I thought travel and languages were kind of uh, sticking together. But one major problem that I had was I was a serial quitter. I don't know if any of you are like me, um, but I quit everything. And I don't know why, but it's like when you, well, I'm probably preaching to the choir about this particular one, but have you ever tried learning a language? And in the first few weeks, it's great and exciting. And then you reach that point where it starts to get a little bit hard, and you're like, oh, well, maybe I could learn Swahili instead. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, that, was, that was how I was feeling, and I was, I was really conscious of this idea that if I was going to embark on this life of languages, I couldn't just kind of do it. I had to go all in. I had to commit to this. So what I thought was I need some accountability. And I don't think I used the word at the time, but that's what I basically needed. And that's how I came up with the idea of actual fluency. And some people ask me, what does actual fluency mean? Well, it doesn't mean anything. It's a completely arbitrary name. Um, <laughs> I later kind of uh, excused myself by saying, well, actual fluency is the fluency you want to reach. And I don't know, it's, it's just bullshit. But, you know, <laughs> I just thought fluency, fluency plus anything, you know. Um, so, and, and again, the name doesn't really matter. I mean, there's the content, you know, what you produce. It doesn't matter what you call it. And I, I felt like, what should I put out there? I couldn't call it the depressed language learner. I mean, that would be too depressing. <laughs> um, and I, I'd like to be the non-depressed language learner, so I guess I, that could have been a good thing. But um, I decided to, I wanted to share the struggles because there was no real mention of depression. There was no uh, kind of, there was a bias actually. If you go to Benny's side in the early days and also the other people producing content, there was a massive bias of success stories. And you can imagine why, you know, it's like I learned French in three months is a lot more exciting than I failed, uh, failing, uh, failed learning French grammar in a week or something, you know. <laughs> so 
there was a huge bias of what people were talking about. So I thought, what if I create this blog and I, later a podcast and I, I talk about how hard it really is? Because I think if there's one thing we can agree on is that learning a language is not something you just kind of do. You know, It's a long process, even the ones that are very similar to our own. It's a struggle. And if you have depression or other cognitive impairments, I mean, I've even spoken to some people who have um, you know, traumatic brain, what do they call it? Um, Injury. Injury, exactly. Um, where they just lost physically a piece of their brain, so it's harder for them to, to learn. And they all fall into this category of impaired learning. And so when I started talking about depression, it was kind of scary. I mean, today it's still super scary because it's kind of putting myself in a very uncomfortable situation. But I feel like the value of me sharing it far outweighed kind of that discomfort that I might have in this this very position. And when I started doing it, people were like, oh man, this happened to me. This is exactly how I was feeling. And, you know, that's what I wanted to touch. I wanted to provide value to people, even though for me it was super scary. And that's why on actual fluency, in the beginning, I didn't say depressed. I would say stuff like, you know, in a rut or stuck or, you know, not feeling it. Lazy even sometimes I used, but I think that's, that's just wrong. So at this point, I had to learn how to learn. And of course, Benny was a great resource uh, because he taught me that you can learn Russian in three months. So I thought, fantastic, I'll learn Russian in three months. <laughs> um, I'll share the results of that later. But in the meantime, I was like uh, looking at more polygots and I found Steve, I found Steve's YouTube channel, I found Steve's uh, blog as well, I found Luke Lampriello and Richard Simcott, Alex Warnings, all these that were producing content back then. And I was just like, how do you learn 10 languages? You know, somebody like Alex Warnings, for instance, was only, I think, 20 when he reached 10 plus. I was like, what? How do you do that? So I thought, you know, how can some people be so good? There must be a secret. There must be a secret. And uh, now, of course, it's a, it's a funny notion, and especially in this room, I guess. Um, but if you go out on the street and talk to people and say, this guy learned 60 languages, 30, 20, whatever, I think they'll assume the same, that there must be some kind of shortcut, some kind of secret, or some kind of super talent. And I thought, well, how can I get this secret? You know, how can I extract it from people? Uh, and I actually also want to talk to these people to get their experiences. And at the time, podcasting was really up and coming, getting popular. Um, this was a few years ago. So everyone had the podcasting app, you know, it's really integrated with iPhones. And I thought, that's it. There's no language learning podcast. Uh, there was some. There's a guy called David Mansuray. He did a language is culture podcast for a while, but it was kind of erratic, and he's kind of quit on it. And I thought, okay, I'll do a podcast and call it the Actual Fluency Podcast, and I'll find the secret. I do it every week. Again, this accountability concept. And the first uh, one of the first guests I want to have on is obviously uh, Steve. <laughs> sitting right there. And uh, it was such a funny experience uh, trying to get Steve on the show that I decided to share one of the emails here um, just to show my kind of enthusiasm and excitement. To Steve Kaufman, I'm a big fan of your videos on YouTube, showing your audience such a day-by-day -day log really gives a rare insight to the workings of a hyper-polyglot. I have a dream, a dream to create a weekly language learning podcast. There's no way I could do, launch the podcast without Mr. Kaufman starting within the first 10 episodes. <laughs> I mean, uh, obviously an excited individual. I don't know if you ever read this, but you, I did send it to you. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I got crickets. And then I thought, okay, well, he doesn't want to talk to a new guy. So I sent him a little, I sent him a little reminder. Hey, Steve, did you get my email? What, five minutes, sir? You only hear the crickets. <laughs> so I sent, I sent Steve a little reminder. Steve, you know, uh, I'd really love to get you on the show. Uh, did you by chance get my email? And instead of like a response trying to organize this, he just sent this. <laughs> I mean, here I am. I just started my website. I'm about to interview one of the most influential internet polygots, and he says, how about now? <laughs> and so this was kind of what was going through my head. Because <laughs> it, was, it was like 11.30 at night in Europe, and uh, you know, I was really excited about this. 
because I only just started the podcast. Uh, Steve is literally like the third or even, maybe even the second person I talked to. So, and I didn't know anyone back then. So just the fact that Steve from YouTube would respond to me was, I mean, amazing. So I thought, I can't lose this opportunity. So 30 seconds of prep, uh, just the basics. Obviously, I knew Steve, so I made it a little bit easier. But still, do the interview, and I didn't completely screw it up, I think. I mean, we had a, a good talk. Um, I've certainly gotten better at interviewing in the last uh, two years, but um, it worked out. And that was a great kind of launch pad to have Steve on, N not only because we had a great talk and, and it was a success, but because then when I emailed other people and I said, I just had Steve on, would you be interested in coming on? That made it a lot easier, you know? Because, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, podcasts being started today. You know, there's probably millions of them. And most of them don't go to, I think seven episodes is kind of like, that's what they go to in limits. And um, now I've had uh, over 100. So that's, that's what came of that. Today the podcasts are still tactical. So we still talk about tips and tricks. How can you learn languages more efficiently? I love to explore tactics. Uh, I'm sure you guys like tactics as well. But today I've kind of rebranded it a little bit to be more about stories. I, I want to know... How did you get to this position where you speak 10, 12, whatever amount of languages? And I kind of feel like this was the story I was talk telling now. So that's what you can listen to on the actual Fluency podcast. Basically, uh, learner stories. How did you, I mean, I uh, just recently had a, a guy uh, on who, when he was 18, lived in Florida, I believe, and he moved to Mexico, learned Spanish, and then he moved all through uh, the countries, went to Europe, and eventually ended up in Asia. So he did a whole road trip and learning the languages along the way. And now he speaks, I mean, nobody really knows, but at least, you know, 25, 30 languages. And these stories are just so motivating and inspirational for me to do. But also, I get a lot of feedback that they're very inspirational to listen to, maybe while you're on the train or whatever. But back to the whole depression. A story. So how did I keep going? Because, you know, if you're coming out of depression, how do you produce a weekly podcast and blog posts and, and all this? And I think it all comes down to the language learning plus the community. So the language learning part, I'll talk about in, in, in just a moment, but you might be thinking, wait, what? How does this? It's like there's a missing step here. But I truly believe that uh, languages, language learning, or actually learning anything is quite beneficial if your mind is kind of uh, suffering, struggling. Um, and we can take a look at some of the common depression symptoms here. Um, I talked about some of them before. Lack of hopes for the future, nothing to strive towards, no purpose, lack of motivation, isolation, mental struggles, the uh, brain fog, they sometimes call it. But if you uh, consider them just as it is, it's kind of like, ouch. Um, but then you can kind of fill in the blanks with language learning, right? Lack of hope for the future? Well, I hope to be speaking to uh, Steve in French. I hope to be speaking to my great aunt in German. Uh, you know, you can add all these goals and, and aspirations. Nothing to strive towards? Well, strive towards T2 then, you know? And the purpose became to share the passion for the learning process and document the journey along the way. So as I'm doing now, actually, this is my purpose now. You know, I'm trying to spread the love of language learning. Obviously, <laughs> preaching to the converted here, but... In a, in a broad sense of the word. And lack of motivation? Well, I mean, look, at, look around you. This is where we get our motivation, at least I do. I feed off of this immense amount of talent and dedication that is around me, the quality of people's content, and just seeing the successes of others. And when somebody sends me a, a message saying, this was great, I, it really touched me and helped me improve my language learning, it just pushes me to, to work even harder. So when you look at this, you might think, well, that's easy then. Depression solved. Um, no, uh, <laughs> unfortunately not. It's not that easy uh, because depression makes it harder to focus, remember, and persist. And if I had to give three tips on what it takes to succeed in language learning, it would be to focus, to remember, and persist. <laughs> so that makes it somewhat harder. But um, actually, that's fine. Uh, sometimes in the community, and because we speak of tactics all the time, we get caught up in this efficiency speed discussion, like how fast can you learn French? How fast can you learn a thousand words? Um, what is the best way to do this? What's the best way to do why? And my point is just that language learning helped me to get out of a dark place. And I'm sure it can help others too. 
But the speed isn't, it's less important. It doesn't matter, you know, I've been doing Russian for years now, and I'm nowhere near C2, <laughs> certainly. And so I would just want to say to people in general, and also in, in this kind of community, I guess, if you suffer from depression or you feel down, I mean, there's a lot of variations of what can be considered depressive states. You're not alone. That's the most important thing. You know, it's a kind of a taboo subject some places, and it's certainly not the most enjoyable one, you know, certainly not the most uplifting one to talk about, but it's part of all our lives. They say, I mean, I've read various statistics, but for instance, in America, the, the estimates vary from one in five to one in 10 adults suffer from depression at some point during their lives. So it, it's really everywhere. And if we can somehow raise the awareness, we can improve the situation, not just in our community, but actually the whole, the whole world. And one thing I want to stress is that if you are suffering from something like that, it's not your fault. Some people might blame themselves, and that leads to nowhere. You know, that's, you're never going to get anything done. And the point I was making earlier, you're not lazy because if you're suffering from depression and you didn't learn Russian in three months, it didn't mean you're a lazy slob or that, you know, you're useless. It just means that you didn't learn Russian in three months. You know, that's it all it meant. And one final note, and, and this is kind of a, a little, I guess this is the serious part of the presentation, <laughs> uh, is um, if you are suffering, don't suffer alone, you know, get help. There are a lot of uh, ways to do that, so I don't want to list any of it, but um, Google can definitely help. Uh, but it kind of has to be said when you're talking about this subject. Uh, I just feel like that, to stress that point for sure. So ultimately, and in conclusion, <laughs> obviously I didn't learn Russian in three months. Uh, um, like I said, I've been doing it for over two years now, and I still feel very, very bad, actually. But some people have also said it's a kind of a tough one to start with. I don't know if any of you agree with that. Um, but it was a good learning experience. Uh, the other thing I didn't do is I didn't find the secret. I didn't find the hyperpolygot secret. Uh, there wasn't any, unfortunately. After 100 episodes of the podcast, it's still the persistence and you know, uh, concentration, consistency of doing the learning process, no matter what learning you do, that will get you to a high level in the language. That's it. And that's, that's still okay. I'm really excited about Russian. You might think, well, you spent two and a half years and you're probably about low B1, I mean, or maybe even high A2 or something like that. But for me, it's, it's, it's kind of life-changing to speak and understand any Russian at all. Uh, because two and a half years ago, I didn't have any aspirations for the future, I did, let alone you know, being able to watch a Russian sitcom and, and you know, laugh at the jokes and stuff like that. Um, so with this point, I just want to say sometimes we're very hard on ourselves, but I think the value of language learning comes at the beginning. At the moment you start learning a language, that's when the benefits, the enjoyment comes. You don't have to reach C2, C1, high levels of intermediate to get any excitement out of it. It starts at the beginning. Uh, actually, the first sentence can be very enjoyable. Just saying, if you go to a, a restaurant, you know the server is Russian speaking. Just saying hi in Russian, you know, that can make her day sometimes. You know, this, the benefits are instant, which is amazing. And just to share some, uh, just some sh uh, more uplifting stuff here at the end, I'm really excited about getting reactions to some of this topic and, how, and my story, saying how my struggles are, are helping other people help uh, stay motivated and learning. And I want to just share one here um, that I got recently because I think this is, I mean, when I read this, it was kind of extraordinary. Um, so the part, this is awesomeness to find. I'm currently blah, 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 blah. I will email you. Have a great time in Canada and congratulations for living my dream. <laughs> I mean, how powerful is that? As somebody I don't know at all, I, he, we just emailed back and forth. He says, thank you for living my dream. And that really puts it into perspective. And perspective is something we don't always have, especially when we suffer from depression, because you think, oh, everything is terrible, and you know, my job sucks, and I can't learn Russian, genitive, plural. And, um. <laughs> but then you, you realize that you're actually in a really good spot. And I, you know, I'm really happy about life right now. I'm really grateful for the community and everyone. And actually to the point where I thought, like, is this a dream, you know? The dream come true, certainly. Um, but going back to the American dream, went to the US, completely unheard of. And if you had told me, in two years, you can go to 
America, Canada, I mean, Canada, what is Canada anyway? If you're Danish, <laughs> if you're Danish, you know, Canada is like the, you know, you think of, what do you think of? You think, maybe you think of the, I don't even know. We don't really have an idea about it. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, how, that's how surreal this is for me. I, I hope that comes through, but um, it's just so weird that this has happened so quickly. And this is all, and again, this speak and understand three new languages, I, I learned Russian and Esperanto to some basic level. I, that's why I put the little asterisk. It's definitely not a master level or anything. Um, that's why I like in uh, New York, they had the name badges, badges. It said, you can speak to me. And it doesn't mean I understand any of it or can <laughs> reply, but you can certainly speak to me in it and I'll enjoy it. So, <laughs> so these are some of them. <laughs> Tens of thousands of listeners every month on the podcast, which is amazing. And I would just not have believed you if you told this. If you had told my story two and a half years ago and said, Chris, this is what is going to happen, I would just not have believed you. But thanks to this amazing community, the future is looking great for me, certainly. And I, I'm going to do certifications because uh, that's, uh, Benny was talking about it earlier also, how... Um, that's kind of a good goal as well. It's a kind of accountability. You're like, I'm going to take the exam April or May or whenever it is. So that really focuses my studies. And that can kind of consolidate a lot of the Russian that I've done that's been kind of all over the place. And the Hungarian is because I live in Budapest right now. So uh, if, in case you're wondering why you would learn Hungarian, which is a great language, by the way, and extremely difficult. So I've chosen two easy languages to start with. Um, <laughs> But anyway, I'm really hoping that would be a good learning experience. And uh, I'll, I'll, of course, report everything on uh, actual fluency, the, where you can find everything, continue to provide, uh, provide the podcast. And also, a big, big thing is continue to meet amazing people at events like this. Because you have, I mean, this is really the big takeaway from this, if anything. If you have to take one thing away, is that language learning didn't used to have a community, you know? We, we used to have independent learning and classroom learning, and they were so separated that you know, there, wasn't, there was no community feeling. So I, I talked to someone just before we came in here, and, and she said, well, language learning to me 20, 20, 30 years ago was very isolating and depressive in itself because you were hiding behind your books. You were burying yourself in your dark rooms learning from teach yourself or whatever courses were available. But now we really have a community, and it's fantastic to see so many faces and young people. I mean, as, as 28, obviously, I'm not the oldest, but when I see people who are you know, 12, 13, 14, and they're really learning tons of languages so quickly, they're so talented, and I just feed off of that energy, and it really is it's amazing. And I hope that we can all, you know, in that way, in a sort of roundabout way, make the world a little bit better. And I think that's... That's all I had to say for today, so thank you. Five minutes. Okay. Well, I'd be happy to take any questions, and i just do a little plug. If, if you have an interesting uh, language learning story to share on the podcast, I'd love to have you as a guest. So that you can just go to that URL, and you can uh, put in your details, and we'll uh, get in touch. You don't send out the crickets to their email? <laughs> I'll definitely respond for sure. <laughs>
And I know, for example, I have many stresses in my life that didn't exist when I learned most of my languages. And right now I'd like to learn Greek, and I'm, I'm seriously thinking, like, how am I going to fit this into my life? What, when I'm at the gym, is it the only time I'm going to have you know, to do this? And I have zero expectations for myself. Right. Like zero. And it's so much easier in life sometimes when you have either zero or very low expectations because you can really appreciate those little moments. Exactly, yeah. So thank you for being honest about that because there could be other people in this room as well who can't be on the fast track to anything. Of course. They just want to enjoy life. Yes, thank you. What's that? I'm one of those people Yeah. Thank you. That's great. You're welcome. You're welcome. Steve? <laughs> you're forgiven, you're forgiven. Also, having been at Russian for close to 10 years, I can tell you, uh, you will always feel inadequate. <laughs> 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 you know? Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. No, it's not. It's, happening, but it's, it's not. not you. No. And I, I watched a video on this subject, and there is a book that I recommend. It's called The Mind and the Brain. Mm -hmm. Do you know the book? No, I haven't seen that one, and no. His name is Jeffrey Schwartz, an American, uh, I guess, psychiatrist or whatever. And he treated people who had, the, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder. Right. People who had to wash their hands every three minutes or whatever. Yeah. And typically the treatment was medicine, right? Some yeah. kind of chemical treatment. And he got them, he had a, a whole series that I can't even remember now, but got them to recognize that it isn't them, and got them to go through a process whereby their mind told their brain to stop doing that. And I always felt that there, there, there was an application of language learning, that it, because you have to, your mind, you have to persuade yourself that you want to learn this language, that you can learn this language, so your, your brain can, your mind can force your brain to develop the habits which can affect us in many ways. So I just thought I would share that. If you're interested in the subject, yeah, I check that. that book by uh, Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz, The Mind and the Brain. Right. Yeah, definitely. And I just want to say, you know, that's uh, the whole idea that it's, it's you is, is this kind of negative circle that you can get into. And I feel like sometimes as language learners, we put immense pressure on ourselves. Uh, for instance, I mean, someone like Benny obviously had good intentions for the name, but it's very easy to feel very inadequate if you got nowhere in three months. But that's not, it's not your fault, you know? That's not, just because one person has deconstructed a method to do that for him doesn't mean that it applies to everyone else. So we should really be careful with putting that much pressure on us. And I think that's why depression is increasing in the Western world. It's not because we're, getting, we're having worse lives, it's just expectations to us are growing and growing. And with technology, we're expecting to learn languages even faster than before. So there's more pressure. And like Susanna said, well, I should be learning this, this, and this, but I don't really, when should I do it? And, uh, and for some people who've learned lots of languages, you suddenly have to maintain those as well. And, you know, it gets, everything's just this pressure point. So, you want to take one more? Sure. <laughs> sure. All right. Uh, I think it was over here. Yeah. And actually, like learning language got you out of depression, but for some people, this kind of pressure actually causes mm -hmm. depression. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would. I would. Right. I would. I would say. I would say one thing though is that the what we talk about at the conference, I think, is less important than the fact that we just hear, like. The fact that we talk about uh, you know, how to learn uh, Russian grammar, how to learn uh, Scottish Gaelic or whatever, to me that's just kind of like enjoyment between. The real value of these events to me, because we could just have this on YouTube, right? We could just do a Skype stream. We could all be in a Google Hangout. But the fact that we come together and, and put it into real life and we talk as people in between the sessions, I think that's where the value is. I don't think so much going to the talks is what's going to you know, change somebody's life necessarily. It de definitely didn't for me. You know, it didn't help me how to use Anki better. You know, that's, just a, that's just a tactic. But 
you know, meeting new, pe <laughs> meeting new people. Um, I wasn't talking about your talk. It's just so <laughs> random. Uh, meeting new people and inspiration of people who had gone through some of these same struggles, maybe not on the level of depression, but certainly the pain of learning a language, which can be, you know, the isolation of living abroad, as some people have. You know, you have all these problems and struggles, but if we share them, you know, it, you know what do they say? A problem shared is a problem halved or something like that. Um, and I think that's what I believe in, ultimately. Uh, so we're here. Uh, I really was here. I come to you. I think when I first started learning about you, uh, I caught a video of you talking about this and just talking about, I guess, lack of motivation. And at some point, you um, you wanted people to, maybe not directly, but, but sort of indicate that you were fat at times. Maybe if people called me fat, that would kind of motivate me right. to, you know, to do something about it. Uh, how, what happened after that? Were, were there positive responses and negative responses? And how did you that one is a very controversial point. Uh, it's, it's not completely... Uh, I can't really draw the parallels of this, but uh, I just wanted to say... I think there's a problem with, uh, you know, fat shaming has gone out of control and political correctness in general. So people are afraid of saying anything. I don't know if that can be sort of worked over to depression. I mean, that's a very sensitive topic. But if you see someone struggling, if you see, hey, uh, you know, P, you, you look a little down today. Is everything all right? You can reach out that way. You don't have to let them suffer alone. Kind of like when you see somebody, a fat guy, order, a, you know, five Big Macs and a big shake. You know, as a friend, I think it's okay to say, you know, is that, you know, good or something. I'm not saying you should call him a fat pig or something. You know, it's not, that's not where I'm going. But I think if we have more focus and more uh, dialogue about the problems, they're definitely more easy to tackle and manage. I don't know if that answers it, but... Uh, well, I'm curious what, what response you got to the community. Did people, you know, either attack you or actually said, hey, Chris, maybe as, you know, as a fellow polyglot, you know, we care about you. All oh, right. Now, actually, nobody said anything to me, which is kind of disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got two, two left. Okay, we've got Steve, and then we have one more comment. comment. I think this gentleman's comment was very interesting. Yeah. My first ever Polyglot conference, the support, the friendliness, the warmth, the stimulus you get from other people who speak lots of languages is all great. But the average person has never learned another language. Right. And so the question is, are we just a group of excited hypergloss showing off, not necessarily showing off, but stimulating each other with what we can do with languages, which is fine and is great and I love them and support it. But how do we then, because for the average person, actually that's scary, that's off-putting, that doesn't encourage them at all. Like, like I can't even learn French here, I'm an Anglophone, I can't learn French, and you guys are all yakking away. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's how we reach out to people who are still struggling to learn their first language, which it's is true. the vast majority of people. Definitely. So I think that's a very good question. All right, Ollie, let's go for the last one. Chris, to what, um, to what extent have you shared this story on the podcast? It's uh, been drip fed a little bit over the years. I mean, it was I at the beginning I didn't want to share it, but um, then I started sharing it through synonyms. Like I was struggling, I was stuck, I was. And then I think about, what is it, about a year ago maybe, I started to tell my list, you know, the, the people in the email uh, who signed up for the email list on Actual Fluency. I, I told them my entire story. And on the podcast, I've then since started to talk about it. But the, there's also a little bit of a problem there because you don't, it's not like you said when we're coming today, you said it's not the most cheery topic. So you don't want to actually, you don't want to kill the excitement in the room by saying, oh yeah, it's depression all day, you know. I, you know you've got this slide up saying you have a story to share. Yeah. And uh, I think you can tell by the reaction in the room that this is a story worth sharing. So I yeah. would suggest that you actually, on the podcast, maybe turn the tables, find a suitable person to interview you. Well, I could just go on another podcast. Like... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Like, uh, what's it called? Ask, uh, ask Oli? <laughs> we, we can do something about it, yeah. No, but, no, but yeah, yeah I, I understand what you're saying. And I'll, honestly, this kind of uh, spe uh, speech is kind of marking my uh, full uh, opening up on the topic. Because now the cat's out of the bag, you know. If, if, if maybe a few thousand people have heard it on the podcast or, or seen it in an email, that's totally different to this now being all over the internet and 
you know, everybody's going to talk about this amazing speech forever, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so for me, this marks a new beginning in a way, a, a small new beginning where now it's full transparency. Uh, and it, wa it wasn't, you know, intensely not so before, but it's just such a scary topic. It's such an uncomfortable topic to be so open about that I, I had to work through just how to deal with that first, uh, which is why I've uh, done it this way. So. Well, thank you for sharing.